But thanks to fundraising, it was saved by a group of community volunteers, folks like you. And now, the West Dells is showpiece, a not-for-profit charitable organization restored to its full glory and heritage designated to boot. Cool. So then right from this very seat, you could check out way more than just great movies. There's all kinds of arts and culture, music, uh, talks, uh, performances, and of course, popcorn. But like in all good stories, there's an unexpected twist. 2020 hits and bam, the new normal, with stages going dark all over the world. Uh, oh, thank, thank you. Now, it doesn't take a PhD in accounting to know no lights, no camera, no cash. Which means we need a little help from our friends to keep on keeping on. So if you can donate a little or a lot, it sure would help us keep the lights on, making you one of the heroes of this story. Stay tuned for the next chapter in the West Dale. Hello, folks, and welcome to Hamilton Originals here at the Westdale. And tonight, my guest is Steve Smith. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mike. Nice to be here. Oh, that's great. I think it's nice to be here, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we're both here, actually. Yeah, we're usually age. a lot closer than this, but uh, we're adjusting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting, getting through the COVID thing. Um, so, uh, Steve. Uh, yes, boy, Mike. Yes, you've had quite an illustrious career, and I'm going to go through it from bottom... <laughs> for you now i kind of wonder too what kind of got you into was it music that you got into as a kid or yeah i mean I, I always loved music there was something there's something fundamental about music it's emotional and you, it's easy to connect to you know I and mean, there's a reason that uh, they have you know little songs for kids and everything because they know the kids will connect with that even at the most simple level so yeah. i was victim to that too yeah. and then i think you know, I, I didn't really get serious until the 60s when uh, the folk era uh, came along. And it looked like anybody could make music. You know, up, and, up <laughs> until then, it was like 40 guys with big horns and everything. And yeah. all of a sudden, a guy with a guitar could just do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I cottoned on to that idea yeah, myself. I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so did you get into, when did you get into acting, though, like? Or did you? Well, I wasn't very good at music, so I had to act <laughs> to make my music palatable. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what happened. Um, we, were in, we had a folk group in, in Streetsville. And by that, that time, I lived in Streetsville. And uh, somebody converted a gas station into a coffee house. Remember Ooh. them? Yeah, a coffee it house. It was called the In Crowd. Oh. And we would go, there were six of us had a group like the New Christie Minstrels. Remember them? Yes, just, you know, remember them well. Beat them with numbers, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. If you sing loud enough, they'll think the band is wrong. It was one of those kind of groups. <laughs> and uh, we, would, we would perform from 9 till 3 on Friday, 9 till 3 on Saturday, 8 till midnight on Sunday, and we got 100 bucks total for, th for the six of us. <laughs> That's cheap, eh? <laughs> and 9 till 3 in the morning. 9 till 3 in the morning, and no booze. It was a coffee house. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just coffee to yeah, keep you up. Yeah, they're all wired. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then that morphed into a, into a rock band, and I, and I think that the first indication I had that, uh, that maybe I was, no, not that I was funny, but that I could be funny on stage uh, I remember playing, there was a club in Toronto called the Friars. You remember the Friars? Yeah, the Friars, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. the guitar player broke a string, and it was a big deal because he didn't have strings. He had to open up his case and get to find yeah. the right, you know, the whole drill. Yeah, the drill. So I just started talking, and the audience was la I don't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> the audience was laughing and laughing away. So anyway, we finished the set. This guy comes up to me, and he says, I'm going to bring my wife back on Saturday night. You're going to do that thing again where the guy <laughs> pretends to break a string. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I thought, hmm, that kind of, that went into the memory bank. Oh, that's a good one. Now, what about your influences as a young tyke, uh, musically or otherwise? Yeah, I mean, you know, 
musically, probably uh, James Taylor was probably the uh, biggest one that, that really, because there was a message there, you know, fire and rain and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. That really hit me. And uh, on the on the comedy side, you know, it was an, most of the, the guys on TV doing comedy had come out of vaudeville. So, you know, they had kind of honed their act and it was a, it was kind of friendly, a bit naive, you know. There, were, there was no animosity. They weren't angry or obscene, you know. And so yeah, like kinda, today. No, it's a different yeah. today. So I, I, grew, I absorbed that. So I had the music on one side, and I had this kind of oh, silly comedy. Not necessarily stupid, but right. silly okay. going in the others. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, I put those together. Wow. Well, that's good, because i got to say, folks, in the last few weeks, I've really been boning up on Steve Smith's uh, songwriting. And back in the very first show that you appeared in uh, with Morag, your wonderful wife, uh, Smith and Smith, you wrote a lot of songs in that show. I did, yeah. Like I, every week. Yeah, I have three or four songs a show, and we did, a, we did like 80, 80, 90 shows. So. And most of them were funny. Yeah, they were. The I odd mean, one was but, quite good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, I mean, they they were comedy songs, so that the, I find I think that would be even trickier to write. So. Yeah, you know, there were there there was that genre way back when there was a, like a group called a couple of guys called Flanders and Swan. I remember, and even the Smothers Brothers. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, yeah. I fell into a vat of chocolate. That that kind of stuff. So yeah. it wasn't unheard of to be doing a comedy well, in in music. And Tom Lear, do you remember him? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Tom yeah. Lear and yeah, um, yeah. And then I thought maybe Mad Magazine had some Oh, I was a huge Mad Magazine. <laughs> you see? 25 cents cheap. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Cheap. Every, every month I had a Mad Magazine. Absolutely. I, I sensed that when yeah. I listened to some of your songs. Yeah. Mad oh, yeah. yeah. Now, I also got to mention Morag, your, your yeah. wife, um, because she was a star in most of the shows until Red Green. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty much. And, and I got to say, folks... Uh, a wonderful person, a great actress. I, yeah. Having watched these shows in the last couple of weeks, she was really good in no, she a was lot really of roles. <laughs> she nailed it. And I'm not easy to work with because I would go right off the script just to oh, yeah. see if I could break her up. Oh, yeah. And we couldn't afford take two, so we oh. <laughs> had, <laughs> had to just go, go with, with it. Yeah, <laughs> go with take one. Yeah. Oh, man, she was good. So Morag and Steve, what a what a pair. Yeah, you know, and this is November. Uh, November 11th we got married. Uh I always say I got a deal on the flowers, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be 54 years this November, so that's that's Whoa. something. Yeah, that, that's crazy. Yeah, right? 54 I years. Know. I don't want to think of how old you must be. Then, <laughs> I don't either. That's, <laughs> that's, I feel fine, thanks. Yeah, that's beyond. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that first show. Uh, oh, and I got to mention that reminds me. Speaking of anniversaries and whatnot, tonight is the actually the 85th anniversary of when the Westdale opened. Wow. In 1935. Wow. Uh, August 31st. So here oh, we are. That's great. You know, here we are with, with Steve. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, there's four people back there applauding. <laughs> they were there. <laughs> they were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But again, back to the Smith and Smith show. I loved that show when I was younger. Um, my mother, my mother loved it, and um, I think we should play a bit. Uh, can you? Uh, I think Mark, you've got a clip lined up because it always started with this great song that you wrote. Don't, yeah. Don't, don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you down, which was uh, a great little song. Let's see a little bit. Oh wait. Oh, that's. Uh, oh wait. Let's show that one too. Mark. What is I that? Mean, that was, let's show that one. That was when you started playing with my band. Oh, that's from Fisher. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's that's Steve Smith wow. playing at the local pub, yeah. Fishers. I got to tell you, folks, this guy brings it all together at Fishers. It's the last Friday of every month until this Colder. latest problem, but <laughs> and it's just like it's like I said, he was a time machine. We're all going back in time to another when things were simpler and we just had well, fun. I, I often quote you, Steve. You came up to me and said, "Mike." You, this is like the fountain of youth. It is indeed. <laughs> it is indeed. Because we all feel like teenagers. Absolutely. But that's over for a while. It'll be back. Yeah, it'll be back. Um, 
But I, I got a version of that. Let's, uh, let's, let's move. Well, first, let's show the opening of the, of the Smith & Smith show. That would be next, I think, Mark. If you can... Ladies and gentlemen, oh my God. Smith and Smith. That brings back memories, and you know some of the guys here when they heard that they said, "Oh yeah, I forgot that was the theme song of the show." Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. Now we just did. We wrote a, a special version for tonight of that song. We're going to play it for you. I'm excited. Yeah. Because you know, I it is a music show, and I thought we got to play at least one song. And <laughs> play, play an A chord for starters. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Keep me on track here, Steve. <laughs> So this is our own version of Don't Let It Get You Down. Don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you down. You get up every morning since the COVID came. Don't ever know what day it is, each one is the same. You strap on your mask and head out the door. Can't be cooped up inside anymore. You give your friend the elbow or maybe the fist. A two meter distance decreases the risk. The question needs an answer, simple and pure. Are they ever gonna find a cure? Don't ever let it get you. Don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you down. Get you down. Uh, All right, Steve. <laughs> thank you, thank you, oh, people. My goodness. Totally unrehearsed, and we wrote that today. So yeah. <laughs> that's why it's a little rough. That's now, all right. The musical Rough's director good. of the Smith and Smith show. Yes. That's Paul. Paul Benton. Yeah, you know right? Paul? Yeah, I know yeah. Paul. So yeah, he used to work at Grant a fair bit. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Yeah, that's where we met, was Grant Avenue, wasn't it? I yeah, I picture you like on a motorcycle. Is that, have I got that wrong? That's right. No, yeah. that was the early 80s. Yeah. I was there. Yeah, okay. But then we met again uh, when you were on your boat, and I was on my boat in Hamilton Harbor. Hamilton Harbor, one yeah, of the greatest yeah. places in the world. You we know, you'd yeah. think you were on the Riviera, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, so right. Long as you don't look east. Just don't look good. towards Stoko. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those were the days. So, yeah, the Smith and Smith show. Now, um, we have another clip from that show, I believe, don't we? Yeah, let's uh, let's see that. I think it was. Oh, I know what this is. Let me introduce this there, Mark. Uh, I believe now I could be wrong because there's so many episodes, but I think this might have been Red Green's first appearance. Oh, on could be yeah. Smith and Smith. Oh, a duck on my hat. Well, maybe not. But okay. anyway, it's a very early version of uh, Red Green on the Smith and Smith show. Let's watch this. <laughs> friends you know uh, a lot of people are asking me all the time what is my favorite fishing spot and I thought that this week I'd uh, I just let the cat out of the uh, well wherever it is that they keep cats uh, and I got her all on film here and why don't we just roll it and we can talk about it and uh, I'll show you where old red loves to fish I'll get uh, I'll get my staff to roll it you want to roll the film Oh, I love. That's why I get to say, "Roll the film, yeah. Mark." So I, I, I just wanted to get that far along. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah. Yeah, I so, created that character. 1978, it was. Oh really? Yeah, I was making fun of Red Fisher. Remember yeah, Red, Red Fisher, Fisher Scuttlebutt, Scuttlebutt Lodge. Scuttlebutt Lodge, and he had poems on there, and uh, 
Sometimes he wouldn't catch a fish. You know, the whole and wherever they had a plane landing, it was always stock footage. It was always the same, <laughs> same plane landing on same the same lake. lake. I met his son years later, and I said, "You know, how would your dad keep that show going? Like, you know, he wouldn't. He would, some shows he'd never caught a fish, and he said, "Well, he got you to watch the whole half hour, <laughs> yeah, so, so he caught something. He, got, yeah. <laughs> he fished someone in. Yeah, he did. Yeah, oh, those were the days. So then, after Smith and Smith." Um, I think the next show was Me and Max. Me and Max, we did. Uh, there was a Morag wanted to try a, a sitcom type format rather so than the sketch. Morag's idea. Oh yeah, oh, okay. everything. Oh, everything was everything, oh. everything. Sorry. Oh, I wish. If I you knew. watch Smith and Smith from the well, uh, let me t can I tell you a little story? Please. Okay, so before Smith and Smith came along, we had left the, the band and we were just being the two of us, and we couldn't get any work. I mean, we'd work six six weeks a year. Right, we were dying. <laughs> we were living out in uh, Stony Creek in uh, an apartment, and we got a call from a guy named Jim Skerritt. You must know I him. Know Jim. Okay. So he had Al Martino come into town. Al Martino is like an Italian crooner guy, yeah, yeah. and he needed an opening act. And he said, you know, asked me if we would open for Al. And I said, you know, I, if you'd called me like six months ago, I would have been all over it. But we're done. Like we're mm -hmm. just done. <laughs> so I hang up the phone, and Mark wasn't too impressed with that. She suggested <laughs> I, c I call him back. <laughs> and, and say, you didn't let me finish, right? Yeah. So I called him back. <laughs> and so we, uh, we opened for Al Martino at Hamilton Place here in Hamilton. Whoa. And uh, it went well. And, and uh, it, you know, on the next day, we had a really nice review in the paper. And then we ended up, we toured with Al Martino, uh, opening for him all across the country in these big places. Anyhow, so now we get back. Well, now what are we going to do? We can't go back to the Holiday Inn. They don't want us anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, it, and we, you know, there's not going to be any more of those. So Morick says to me, well, I think we should have a television show. I said, great, I'm in, you yeah, know. Count me in. Yeah, yeah <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> so she says, we got to have a television. Let's start with where we are. We live in Hamilton. Let's start in Hamilton. If we don't get a television show in Hamilton, we'll go somewhere. We'll go to Sudbury. We'll go wherever we have to go, but we're going to get a television show. <laughs> so, okay. okay. So I phoned CHCH and uh, trying to get this guy, general manager's name was Frank Denardis, right? Ah. And all I get is his, like, secretary, and all, you, all, all that Mr. Nardis know you called, or he's in a meeting, or, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I'm calling every day. <laughs> and then finally one day, Maureen says to me, uh, have you called? Have you called CHCH? And I said, jeez, you know what? I'm done with calling them. <laughs> You're so smart, you go call them. So she, so she, she goes into the bedroom. She comes out a couple minutes later, and says, we've got a meeting Tuesday. <laughs> 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 so we went in, and we met, we sat down with Frank, and he... He later, I mean, through the, the whole process of us being there, he became one of my best friends in the whole world. But anyway, he started by saying, that night you opened for Al Martino, I, I was in the audience. Whoa. Yeah, and he said, uh, as far as I was concerned, I think the, the paper was a little rough on you. <laughs> so, Holy cow. He says, because well, he says, uh, somebody's going to give you a television show. It might as well be us. And then away we went. You know? Nice. And, and for, I can tell you, with Frank, for... Nine, ten years, I would go in and have a meeting with him, telling him what Morig told me to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would shake hands, and he'd say, just write down on a piece of paper what it was I agreed to. So I have something <laughs> in the filing cabinet <laughs> yeah. when I have to pay you. I can pull, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, that's the way it was, okay. you know. And then later, new management and a, a contract wasn't good enough, you know. Like, it's just, oh, it yeah. was a different era, a yeah. different... Frank, he would he wouldn't break his word, and I yeah. would I I wouldn't let him down either. So it yeah, was, yeah, it was a two way. It, it was uh, everything was done on a handshake. Yeah, as absolutely, they say, right? yeah. not like nowadays. Yeah, I don't know what the question was, but that's how that well that's how that whole thing started with us, and that's how more I, I we were talking about more getting, yeah, yeah. and then she decided Smith and Smith was kind of a sketch comedy show, and sitcom was seen to be the way to go. So how can we do a sitcom that doesn't, doesn't cost any more money than what Smith & Smith was? Well, we ended up playing multiple characters, and we got our sons involved, and, and we did it for a year, and it was experimental. And it was a tough writing assignment for me, which I enjoyed. But then it was time to stop punishing our children <laughs> and, <laughs> and be, be responsible for generating income without them. Nice. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. And that was me and Max. Yeah. But, uh, wow, I love that story of how it all began. Yeah, that was nifty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, then we move on to another big hit you had, Comedy Mill. Comedy Mill was good. I got uh, a call from, there was a, an organization that formed in Ottawa called Telefilm. And it was, they, were, they were put in place to uh, underwrite television productions. So the guy called me from there and he said, 
you're you're like a prime guy that we should be using. I mean, we're going to make this money. This money will be available to you to up your budgets, and you can you know do what you do at a higher level. I was like, hey, hey, awesome. Okay, bring it okay. On. So you know the devil's in the details. Yeah. Whoa. You weren't allowed to do anything that was similar to what you had done before. Ah. So if you had done anything that was even mildly successful, that was off the table. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's the way government works sometimes. Yeah, they're good so at that. We, that's what, how we ended up with coming up with the concept of Comedy Mill, which was kind of like a think tank of creating funny ideas for people. And then we hired great actors, Linda Cash and Mag Ruffman and Peter Callahan. And, and we had, and we had up, upgraded the music. Uh, Bob Doidge, your friend, Bob became Deutsch. our musical director, and we recorded all the music at Grand Avenue Studio. And the whole... Production level and everything went up, you know. Yeah, and yeah. We, so we did we we did that for another couple of years. Were there more writers on that? Yeah, or was we, that still just no? It wasn't me. It wasn't just me. In fact, even on Smith and Smith, it was always me and a guy named Rick Green. Rick, Rick Green, yeah, right. Yeah. Now yeah. the thing with Rick Green was I couldn't afford to pay him scale. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> probably go to jail for this story, <laughs> but uh, so he wanted to do the job, and I was happy to pay him, and he was happy to get what I could pay him. Right, but we just couldn't do it through normal channels. I'm yeah. sure you've experienced yes, this. Yes, yes, yes. Go so around. I said, but on the other hand, I wanted to give him a credit on the show. I didn't want it to look like I had written everything on my own. So if you watch <laughs> Smith and Smith, if you watch the credit roll, it'll say contributing writer Enrico Gruen. That's Rick Green. Oh yeah, Enrico Gruen. <laughs> it was okay. like a Spanish yeah. version uh, of Rick Green's, but at least it meant to other people. Well, he does. Steve Smith is having some help writing uh, this. To yeah. Whoever this guy is. So yeah, and Rick and, and I wrote together for years. And for years, years, right? Years. Right, right through Red Green. Red we, Green. We created Red, Red Green together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Rick Green. Yeah. Huh. All right. So that was um, the comedy mill. I think we've got a clip from that. Do okay. We, uh, now I just want to preface this by saying there was a lot of songs in that show as well yeah. that you wrote. Yeah. And I noticed that a lot of them were. Um, sort of satirical love songs, like you did a lot of love. Oh yeah. Which was about loving Ladas, if you folks remember those Russian cars yeah. that came in in the 80s. You don't pay a cent until it starts. <laughs> 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 yeah. So that was a lot of love song. You yeah. did another one about trucks, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Truck, truck love or something. Truck love. Um, so there was a lot of love. And then I happened on this one episode the other day uh, called, um, what's it called? Our hometown. Oh, gee, the, the Bruce, the Bruce Springsteen thing. And, and it's a ripoff of Bruce <laughs> or John Cougar or one of those yeah. guys, right? So let's roll that clip and watch a bit of that. Oh, the, listen to the words. <laughs> the words are going. Yeah. yeah. Great, <laughs> and you saw some great actors there: Mag Ruffman, yeah. uh, Linda, Linda Cash, Cash and Peter Callahan, and Peter Callahan, yeah. and, and Morag playing keyboards. So, <laughs> <laughs> so another one of Steve's great songs, because uh, I don't think you've gotten a whole lot of credit yeah, for songwriting. No, you're, you're right, darn it! You know, I need more credit. Yeah. So you're gonna get that tonight, Thank brother. Thank you. You, I you deserve it because I, I think you're it. one of the best writers out there. <laughs> that's for sure. Well, did uh, you ever? Do you know how the Red Green theme got written? Do you know that story? Well, sort of, but oh, yeah, wait, tell I'll us. Oh wait, oh wait. You want okay, me to tell you? well, no, well, we're gonna work up to that. How about all okay? Right, right. Because we still, I just wanted to mention a couple of other shows, uh, History Bites. Yeah. Now Rick produced Rick, that. Yeah. I, I really wasn't involved with that show, but our our company produced it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but okay. yeah, Rick kind of spun off on that because he knows a lot of stuff. And he knows a lot about history, yeah. and he seems to have something against the Catholic Church for some reason. So he, <laughs> uh, who put, it all, he put it all <laughs> together and I'm it became him. History Bites. <laughs> 
And did he do uh, Supertown Challenge? No, Supertown was that was my that was, oh, I was like to blame for that one. Yeah, I don't know if any of you saw that one. I I I don't think I was watching TV in that era, but uh, can you explain that? That was a neat concept. I'd like to try. Okay. Well, that's the best I can do. Um, the Comedy Network was just starting up, and they needed a lot of content, and so they had a little bit of money. And it was kind of like Smith and Smith. It was kind of give you a little bit of money, and you can do this, but it's got to have a real Canadian feel to it. So I had this idea of making a game show that would uh, feature different towns, small towns from all over Canada, and we'd have musical numbers and people, l local characters from the town that we'd interview and have games with them and all that kind of thing, kind of like yeah. a, it, was, it was a bizarre show. Colin Mockery was our host. He did a great yeah, job. Colin and it gave a lot of work to uh, a lot of Canadian comedy actors, and that was at least half of the reason because the Comedy Network was trying to develop a pool of comedians, you know, that to wow. use for their shows. So we would we would have 30 or 40 comedy actors run through the... So they got, they all got their little demo reel out of shows like Supertown Challenge. Wow. Yeah. That, that, that's good. Supertown Challenge. Supertown I, Challenge. I found a few of those on uh, YouTube. So folks, uh, you can you can catch a bit of that. <laughs> yeah. History Bites is up there. We couldn't find me and Max anywhere, but most of what Steve's done is, uh, is up there. So... Let's move along to the big one. Um, that brings us to about the early 90s when you started Red Green. How'd that happen? Yeah, well, um, Maury came to me and said, you know, b both of our boys are at this point starting high school. And she felt this is a time when one of the parents at least, you know, needs to be home when they get home from school and stuff. And she knew their names, so it seemed to be ah, right, she was right. a natural. <laughs> you couldn't remember. No. Okay. <laughs> so I thought, okay, okay, so what am I going to do? Well... I, I've al I'd always enjoyed being Red Green, and we'd always had good uh, response from the character. And I remember maybe the mid-'80s or later than that, I don't know, but um, you know, mid-'80s, uh, the CH was running the hockey games on Wednesday nights, and they never knew when the hockey game would finish. Might finish at 20 to 11, might finish. They needed something to bridge from there to 11 o'clock. So they came and asked me if I would do Red Green as a show to fill in that gap. Oh. I didn't. I didn't do it. But in my, it's one of those things that goes into your mind. Like, boy, they must. They must think that's got some legs, you know. Yeah. So uh, when it came later, and this is now 1989, and we had that whole thing, and Morgan's going to stay home, and then I said, okay, uh, I think I can get CHCH to give me one season of Red Green, you know, and that'll get me through. Then I'll figure out what I'm going to do after that. Just, but it'll be fun. Just to have fun. Rick and I just had yeah. a ball. So yeah. we got to. I remember going to them, and I said. I need you to give me enough money that I can do something, but not enough that you care what it is. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. that philosophy. And that yeah. became, so then we, that was that was a green light for us. Like we could just we just did anything we felt like. Just had a ball, and so oh. um, you know, and it, it went on the air, and it, it kind of it found an audience, uh, and uh, we had some bumps. We had some bumps, but uh, over overall, in the long run, hugely successful. Yeah. Yeah, what a show! Uh, Three hundred episodes. Uh, yeah, fifteen years. Was fifteen it? years. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's a kind of a neat thing that happened. By then, we were on the CBC. The last nine years, yeah, we were on CBC, and uh, the program director was a guy named Slocko Klimku, super guy. And when it came to our, every season, you know, we'd meet him and and see if they wanted to do it again. And after our thirteenth season. I remember sitting down with him, and I said, um, you know, I, obviously you're going to do whatever you want to do, but I'll tell you what I got in mind. If I do two more seasons, that'll be 300 episodes, 15 years, and I'll be turning 60. I, said, I know an exit ramp when I see one. <laughs> yeah. So he says, I'll tell you what, we'll write up the contract that way. He gave me a two-year contract. That's unheard of, right? At least in my world, that's unheard of. Yeah. And what it allowed me to do was I could tell all the actors, all the crew, everybody involved with the show, that we're going to do this for two more years, and then we're not going to do it anymore. Plus, it informed the writing. You know, you could have stories could wrap up, characters could kind of complete a circle of some kind. So it, die off, it, or it, die whatever off. was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Kill them off. But it was, you know, that was, I thought that was a really classy. But I've met a lot of classy people in my career. I must say. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, that's nice. Now we, I think we have a, a clip from there. I'd like to show. Uh, this is one of my favorites because, you know, we're both married and we, uh, well, well, let's just see the clip. <laughs> when you're married, like a lot of us are, you notice that wives make lists. Grocery lists, Christmas card lists. People will owe us a party. 
people we owe a party to, people who will never be invited to darken our doorway again, or as she also refers to them, your friends. But the scary list is the one she has for you. You know what I'm talking about. That list of odd jobs, big and small, for you to do around the house. Now it's called a list, but it doesn't actually exist on paper. She's way too smart for that. She keeps that list in her head. That way she can add to it without you noticing. And you, sir, will never be finished. You know what? That's a good thing. Speaking on behalf of all men, we're not at our best when we have nothing to do. Your wife knows that. That's why she makes this list. So let's be honest, we're better off married and busy than single and listless. <laughs> Remember, I'm pulling for you. We're all, we're all in this together. together. Oh, classic. You had so many words of wisdom, especially for married men, that uh, I've been living by for a while. So yeah, let's get to that theme, the theme for Red Green. Yeah. Um, well, I went to Bob, uh, Bob Doidge, yes. and uh, I told him the kind of show we were going to do, and... and I needed him to create kind of an ambience. So what he wanted to do was he, he felt I was strong at, at uh, creating melodies. So he took a while, and he recorded all the instruments and handed me this. I think it was a, probably a cassette at that time, not even a CD. It was probably a cassette. And it was the track with no melody on it. Huh. So, you know, and, and it was him playing the concertina and the Jew's harp probably, I mean, spoons, everything on there. So I rode around with that in my car, for, and I would try to hum things along to it, you know. And then uh, my son, he was probably 10 or 11 at that point, and I'm playing it, and I'm singing a song. And I said, Mike, I think I've got the tune now. What instrument do you think it should be? He says, well, should, it's got to be an accordion. Got an accordion playing that. Nice. Yeah. Your son said that. Yeah. So I went back to Bob, and I said, okay, here's the tune. It's got to be an accordion. And then <laughs> here we wow. are, you know, 30 years later. Now, and that was Dave or Max? It was Dave. Okay. Yeah, the guy I'm doing the podcast with, yeah. Credit goes to Dave, the yep. podcaster. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to mention him in a bit. But, yeah, that's uh, quite the theme. Da, 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 yeah, it's, all, it's kind of like a French-Canadian. feels French-Canadian. Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, it's but great. I, was, I was up in, uh, I, I've been to Alaska many times. The show was very popular there. And, and uh, the last time I was there, they had this golden Golden Days Parade, and I was in a parade, and, and that song was playing, like, incessantly on my float. But little kids, you know, they get up on the street, and they're dancing and clapping yeah. their hands. And oh. That is so neat. you, you know? got to love it, eh? I love that. Music, the way it affects people. Oh, uh, it's incredible. Eh? It's incredible. Just, it's well, you know, thing. in Smith & Smith, that, the last song, you know, Bad Luck, Heartache, that one, uh, people sang that at their weddings and everything, oh, and yeah. then they asked me, Sing the whole song. I said that is that is <laughs> the whole it. song. It's <laughs> like it's the it's just a kind of a stinger to end the show, you know. But yeah, yeah it does. Music touches people, no doubt about it. Yeah, that's for sure. Big and deep. What about the cast? You had some killer people on the the cast, of course. Harold, Pat McKenna. Yeah, Pat McKenna, super okay. guy. Now let me tell you how I found Pat. Okay. <laughs> I was I was casting the show and I was down at Second City, and I was I knew Pat. You know, and I had seen him do stand up and everything, and he's very talented. But he he, he wasn't even uh, on the radar for me. I was looking to see the other guys, and I'm looking at all the other people and everything. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, they're good, but would they fit with me? You know, and then uh, they came out. It was supposed to be a grade seven class, I think, presenting their science projects. And all of a sudden, Pat gets up and says, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, and all of a sudden, yeah. they go, well, there's there's the guy, you know. Yeah. And then I remember. I did want to have an old guy. I wanted to have one old guy on, <laughs> and I never got one. And I was the first day of shooting. I was really disappointed. I'm in my dressing room thinking, "I wish I'd gotten an old guy." And then I caught a glimpse in the mirror. I'm like, <laughs> "No, we're good. We're good. No, we're good. <laughs> we got it all." <laughs> and Gordon Pinsent, you know. Gordon Pinsent. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you that story. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Gordon and I uh, were working on. A, I was uh, trying to get a sitcom going for Gordon on CBC. So I went in there, and I got a development deal. And the way that works is they give you a little bit of money, and they'll pay you to write a script. So I wrote a script for the thing, and I got paid. And it never got picked up. They didn't go to pilot or anything. So I sent Gordon a little card, a letter or something, with a check in it. It wasn't a huge check, but I, I said, you know, it's not right. that like I got paid. You didn't get paid, so I, I don't feel good about that. So like three days later, comes back, return mail, and it's <laughs> he says... <laughs> And the check's in there. He says, just want you to know not every Newfoundlander will take money for not working. 
<laughs> so I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll make it, let's, let's make a compromise. I'm doing this crazy little show right now. If you come out and work for me for one day, I'll overpay you. Okay, so that'll satisfy you. You do the work. It'll satisfy me to make up for maybe me thinking I didn't treat you properly. And that's what he did. And he came out and sh for w in one day, and we shot about eight things, and he was fantastic, and he ended up coming back for 15 years. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, what an actor, too. Oh, what an actor. Because yeah. he, he was, in, in our show, he would tell ridiculous lies. Like his grandmother was uh, smuggled out of Russia in a giant Fabergé egg and opened a chip wagon in part asbestos. I mean, he would, <laughs> but he would say it, and, and you'd believe, you'd believe yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh. and then one night at the uh, Gemini Awards, uh, Graham Greene was there, and he comes over to me and he says, "What do I have to do to get on your show?" And well, I say, "I, I'm pretty sure you just did it." <laughs> yeah, that's it. We'll <laughs> yeah. take you. Yeah. So I was yeah, going to mention Graham Greene. Yeah. yeah. Great and and um, Charlie Farkasen. I mean, I I thought Don, like I was a huge fan of Don Heron. I thought he was a brilliant, brilliant man. Yeah, and kind of a good fit for Red Green to Charlie. Yeah, kinda, we had him know, on as a charter member, and uh, we used to, we have an audience warm up guy. Well, actually, most of the time it was Dave. What when when Don was there, Charlie Farkasen was there. Anytime there was a break, he's out there, just off the top of his head, just being absolutely hilarious. Oh yeah, yeah. Charlie. Um, now, there's also Jeff Lumby. Oh, yeah. And I got a little story, because when my kids were young, my two daughters, uh, they always watched in the morning a show out of Winnipeg, I oh, think, called geez. Size Small. Size Small. And he was like a little kid in yeah. that show, yeah. right? It was his parents and yeah, him. Yeah, he's still about the same size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I know him. Then he started working at the radio station. He's on your show. So Yeah, Jeff, Jeff. and I uh, were judges at the... Uh, the Oktoberfest parade in Kitchener in about 1993, I want to say. Mm. And that's how we met. And we kind of hit it off. And then I, I created a character for him for the show. And uh, the he's super sucker. Guy. Yeah, he's a su septic uh. sucking guy. If your <laughs> eyes are stinging, my phone should be ringing. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, but he, he, you know, he has that sort of energy. And I thought to, to, to say, uh, to put an entrepreneurial spirit into yeah. that job. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just such a great contrast. Yeah, because like, he'd stand by his truck and give you a sales oh, pitch, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He yeah. was good. And um, let's not forget Ian Thomas. Oh, yeah, Ian. Dougie Ian, Franklin. The, the, the mechanic, yeah, wasn't he? No, he was a four-wheel drive guy. He had, a, oh. he had a big monster truck. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had meals on four wheels. Like, he could drive his truck up and deliver meals to the second story. <laughs> <laughs> right from his truck. Ian yeah. Thomas. What, and... And yet, you know, he's a great, great songwriter. Oh, absolutely. I've just finished his two books because he's coming on in a couple of weeks. Oh, so nice. I thought I better bone yeah, up yeah, on his yeah. books. But what a great author he is. Like, I don't know if you've read his books. I but haven't, no. They're both really, really good. Yeah, I'm not surprised. He's a really smart guy. Oh, is what he, he is a smart guy. Yeah, he's a smart guy. But in the show, he's kind of yeah, just I know. a regular. But he loves joke. to play. He yeah. loves to play. Oh, and he's got so many voices too, eh? He's good yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, no, he's so. uh, he's he's our Bill Murray. And uh, Wayne Robson. Oh yeah, Wayne, know, yeah, Mister Canada kind of guy. I think he did a. I saw him do a Canadian Christmas special or something. Yeah, but yeah. You know, Wayne passed away sadly, but yeah, sadly. yeah. But he was just solid, solid. I had so many solid guys like Bob Bainbro, Wayne, Jeff. They became the core, and there was a period of time there where Pat had won. W awards in drama and comedy and wasn't sure which one he wanted to pursue ended up moving to Los Angeles and taking a run down there and so I kind of left me a little bit high and dry so I, I kind of relied on those guys to pick up the slack and boy did they ever so yeah, yeah. yeah it worked out great oh that's great um, yeah so just for you folks out there Ian's coming on on September uh, 21st so uh, say hello to him for me I haven't seen him in a while yeah, yeah. He's a cool yeah. guy. Yeah, he's living in Dundas now. Oh. Um, yeah, because, you know, he lived in Winona forever. Yeah, but yeah that's what I think, 50 Road there. there yeah, right. yeah, but we'll get to him later. Nice. So I got to ask you about writing because, geez, like, to write comedy day after day, I can't imagine how you come up with all that stuff. Like, how? Yeah, I think for me, I can only speak for myself, but I'm not actually writing comedy. I'm taking dictation. My mind uh, just spews that stuff all the time. I went really? to, yeah, when I was in public school, I was in this odd school. I know it was in Toronto, but uh, grade six, seven, and eight, I had the same teacher for all three years. And uh, from about the second month in of the first year, she said, uh, nobody can speak out in class except him. I could talk out in class anytime I wanted to, say whatever I wanted. 
Wow. And that was a double edge for me because on the on the one hand, uh, it was a, it was a huge compliment. But on the other hand, I took it as a responsibility. I, I didn't want to blow the offer. Like, I want to use my A material. Yeah, you've know? you got to say good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and what she was saying, and she told my parents later, was that the things I said, they weren't disruptive. They just they make the, they were entertaining. You know, it would, it would support what she was doing rather than tear it down. You know? Oh, yeah. So that, th I had that kind of mind. Like, I was born with it, you know. So, yeah. so for me, writing comedy, I was telling you earlier, uh, before the show started, when I was doing the touring, I'd, I'd write these 22 pages of script, and that would give me 90 minutes of, of material. And then I would do it for a year, you know? And it was just, I would be so bored with it. it was, I'm not, I just need to be constantly ha starting with a blank page every day. I hate it, you know? Yeah, but... But it, by the end of the day, I feel pretty good about it, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know I, what you're... What I hate worse is not having to do it, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the blank page. That Well, that's a tough one. But, uh, boy, you've sure done some great stuff. What about... um? The duct tape thing now, 3M, did they ever get, I think they got involved, didn't they? They what did, happened there? they did. This is the business side of me, all okay. right? You okay with that? Yeah, I'm good with it. Okay, so I, wrote, I read a book on branding, okay, from the early 80s, branding. Trout and Reese, wasn't the, it? Those two authors, they wrote yeah. that book on, I forget what it was called, but yeah, okay. Yeah, branding. positioning the battle for your brain or something yeah, like something that. Yeah, something like that, uh, positioning yeah, the battle Jack for Yeah, Jack Reese and Al Trout, yeah, yeah I, I yeah. can't believe you. I huh? read that. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, yeah, that really stuck with me. You know, that to, to find something bigger your, than yourself that you can hook onto, you know, ride that thing. Oh, yeah. So when we had had some success with Red Green, and I brought everybody, I had a PBS rep there, and I had a CBC person. I had I was, I was writing books at that time. I had a somebody from Macmillan, I don't know, and another agent. I had them all around the table, and I said, "How would you define the Red Green brand? I need something to hook onto, right?" Well, they were stumped. I mean, somebody said. Well, it's not as stupid as you think it is. I, do, I didn't want to go with that one. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Okay. And at the end of the meeting, I just went home and I thought, you know, it's, it's duct tape. Duct tape is that that's, that's the brand I got to hook myself onto. So we consciously uh, made Red Green almost the personification of duct tape. There's a duct yeah. tape and everything called Because it's a quick and easy fix. Yeah. Men like me would rather fix something 20 times that takes five minutes than spend a whole day on it and fix it properly, you know? Yeah. So, and then, and then uh, we, the first time we went to 3M, uh, we said, uh, we think that you're selling a lot more duct tape because of us. And they said, oh, yeah, we definitely are. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. What's your point? What's your point? <laughs> yeah. But eventually they ended up, uh, they sponsored the show to the point that they supplied the duct tape. Then they, they put actual cash money into our movie, and uh, they, they were a good partner. Yeah, nice. Because you did use a, an awful lot of duct tape. We in that did. Show. We went through a gross a year, like twelve dozen rolls of duct yeah. tape. And one one scene, I was making, trying to make a hovercraft out of a leaky <laughs> rowboat, and I, I thought if I could get a wide enough piece of duct tape, I could do the whole bottom of the hull. So they gave me. They, they make it in a three foot three, roll, yeah. and then they cut it into the two inch. Oh. Right. So I got a three foot. This is perfect. A three foot roll until I. I tried to un un oh, undo it. Holy <laughs> mackerel! Like twelve guys on the yeah. stand and on. Anyway. Yeah. That's okay. why they cut it. That's why they cut it. Uh, the duct tape. Yeah. That, yeah. that is sticky. Um, but people, people see duct tape now, and a lot of them associate that with me. They'll think of me. You know. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, there's so many shows that my favorite. I just watched the other day was uh, How to Make Your Own Hummer. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, Hummers are super wide, yeah. so <laughs> Steve goes to the junkyard, I yeah, guess. Yeah. you got two matching white Toyotas. Yeah, Toyotas, yeah. Take the right doors off one, yeah, the left off the other, yeah. and tape them together, and now you got a really wide... Yeah, you got two radios, you got two heaters. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <It's, it's, laughs> That's great, yeah. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and your hybrid car, and... Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, well, we had a lot of uh, crazy stuff. I remember one in particular where... Um, the premise was that it's dangerous to carry a boat on your roof rack. You know, it could fly off or fall off. It'd be a lot safer if you could carry the boat under your car, right? Oh, I never right? thought of that. No. So I got the guys to get me four rear tractor wheels. You know those wheels that are like that big? So I put those on a Honda Civic. Oh, okay. okay so now she's sitting <laughs> two, three feet off the ground, okay? Yeah. And now I put the boat under it, strap that on there. So now it's safe. And then I'm yeah. thinking, and I say in the script, Wait a second. This is not only a safer way to carry a boat. This is now an amphibious, an amphibious vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Right. So now the money shot. I'm supposed to drive this thing into a pond. Okay. Well, our production manager was a lady. Her name was Sandy Richardson. Yeah. Just a sweetheart, great lady. And she's going, 
Oh, oh, hold it, hold it. <laughs> that boat will not support the weight of that car. You're going to go down. I said, gee, I, I, I don't know. So we had no, we kind of asked the whole crew. And every, it was kind of 50-50 whether it would. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, and there was another wrinkle was that the wheels were so big, they overlapped the door. So if I needed to get out, I couldn't you open couldn't the door. Get out. I couldn't no. So the compromise was we rolled down the window and they took off my wireless mic. So at least if I went down, I wouldn't ruin no, Yeah, you wouldn't ruin a good microphone. Mic. <laughs> okay, so now everybody's like on tenter hooks as I start, first of all, I start the thing up, and there's a reason small cars have small wheels, right? Because they can't move a big wheel. <laughs> you could smell that clutch burning from <laughs> Oshawa. You know? So anyway, I got it moving. I go, I go into the pond. Forget about the boat uh, supporting the car. The boat never touched the water. There was enough buoyancy in the tires oh. to support <laughs> the really? whole thing. Nope. And now I'm driving. Now everybody wants to take the thing uh, for a ride around yeah. the pond. So there you go. There's a little physics lesson for you. Nice. Could do some water skiing behind <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, a lot of fun. Now I know that it all, the show went super international. Like it's big in the U.S., but it's yeah. We have more we have more fans in the U.S. than we do in Canada. That's for sure. But it, Canadians are the reason the show carried on we got we got canceled in our second season and i just thought okay i didn't think it was gonna last that long i was shocked we went two years but the letters from the canadian i mean i'm talking in this area too uh, we have we're on several stations in canada but mainly from this area like st Catharines and <coughs> um fort erie and anyway it was i had a, a post office box because we had started a fan club and I had a post office box on over on kenilworth and I'd go over there, and this everybody knew the show was canceled. And the guy'd say, uh, "It was like Mir Miracle on 34th Street." He'd say, "Yeah, we got your mail." So this is mail to, for Red Green. You know, so I go, and he'd wait till I got to the door. He said, "No, no, wait, wait. I think there's a bit more." And then he'd bring out this big box, boom, big box on the <laughs> on the counter, and it was people saying, "Do what you got to do to keep this show on the air." And when I went down to the states to try to get a deal. I would go down dressed as red green, and I had a hockey bag full of those letters. And I go up and I put them on the guy's desk, and I say, "You're guessing, I'm guessing. These letters are from people who aren't guessing." And yeah. that's how we ended up uh, in in the states. Wow! But it was Canadians. It wasn't. It's not like I went down and made it a success in America, and then brought it back here. It, yeah. I, 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 the fact that I find I find Canadians are a little pickier. They're a little fussier than Americans. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Usually when a Canadian show goes off the air, there's a street party. You know, <laughs> They don't usually fight for it. Yeah, so I thought something, something's going on. Oh, boy. Am I talking too much? No, no. We're <laughs> great. No, it's perfect. Um, and I think, you know, it's probably because we all, you know, sort of know a, a guy like Red Absolutely. Green. Absolutely. Right? And, and we can kind of identify, not so much personally, but you got a friend like that, right? Well, yeah, I you know, I say to people, I, I go all over North America and I just keep meeting the same guy, you know, I mean, <laughs> everywhere. And they yeah. seem to have, like you just said, they have a red green in their family. Uh, I get so many comments from women that are maybe late 20s, early 30s. This was the show they watched with their dad and it helped them understand the way they're they're yeah. their dad exactly oh, yeah. and and not only does it they identify that that, that i'm kind of like a relative of, of theirs it seems to be a relative that they kind of liked right so i become the beneficiary of somebody else's goodwill i'll yeah. take that yeah any day, any day. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and i say i say to people you probably have a red green in your family and if you don't it may be you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it might be you <laughs> oh man now, another thing I wanted to talk a bit about is, well, just touching on the COVID thing and the pandemic. Um, you know, it's a time of um, great change. Uh, we're all getting used to this whole thing. And I thought I, I found another clip of yours that uh, talks to that um, very issue of, yeah. of change, especially in men. So, Mark, um, roll the film, as, as, as <laughs> Red said in that other clip. Roll the film. <laughs> I want to talk to you older guys about something you haven't done in a while. Change. Okay? People say you're out of it because for the last 20 years you've been dressing the same way, talking the same way, and thinking the same way. I say good for you. <laughs> you stick with it. Somebody's got to stand up for tradition. And hold firm because too much is changing. The phone rings weird now. Running shoes look like spaceships. <laughs> Even the continents are shifting, but not you. <laughs> You stick to your guns. You keep wearing those short sleeve polyester dress shirts. <laughs> you keep spouting your opinions to anybody who will listen. Somebody's got to preserve what's normal and sensible in this world. And who knows? 
Polyester might come back. Maybe your opinions will catch on. People will think you're a genius. But so far, no change. <laughs> I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, when on the last episode, I, I finished that winding that, that fly winding and took it fly. out of the holder oh. and walked off with it. Oh, you, oh I see. Yeah, you finally, yeah. Touch your always, You're always. Yeah, I it. wound that for 15 years. <laughs> Now, uh, also, let's chat a quick, a quickly about the the movie. The movie, I couldn't believe that movie came out. I thought, fantastic. Yeah. Duct Tape Forever. Duct Tape Forever, yeah. So, how did that happen? I, the, the, it was fan-driven. I mean, I, after oh. what happened, uh, the story I told you about the letters and everything, that was when I made the decision to go with the fan, focus on the fans, that we immediately started having a live audience. The first two seasons, we didn't have a live audience. Oh. Third season, we ended up going to London, the CFPL did it there, and had a live audience. And then that was it, and then we never went back. And then the fans started, they wanted to have, a, a, let's have a red-green movie, you know? So uh, we looked into it, and it's, it's, it's a really tough business, you know, let me put it that way. Um, yeah. You really need an American release to make it work financially, and uh, a lot of the uh, big production houses also own the movie theaters. So they're not interested in putting a movie in their theater that they didn't produce, right? Yeah, That's yeah. their store window. Uh, so what I did was I, had a, I made a competition with the PBS stations, and um, the top 40 would get the movie in their town, and the top 10, I would actually go to the premiere of the movie in their town. So we ended up on our own dime releasing the, the movie in 40, uh, 40 cities in, in America. Just just for the hell of it, really. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, we lost a, we lost our shirts on the movie. <laughs> oh, you did? Oh, eh? I would say $700,000. Oh. But we it so. came back. Oh, I mean, it took, you know, 15 years, oh, yeah, you know. but eventually... It's like a house mortgage. Eventually <laughs> yeah, it makes sense, yeah. you know. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I, I'm really proud of the fact that I... I did a movie, you know, I yeah. would never do another one. People say, why don't you do another movie? I say, just, just watch that one backwards. It has a different ending. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's smart. He's, <laughs> he's smart, this guy. Uh, I think we got a clip from that. Do we have that clip, Mark? Uh, I think we got the trailer or something oh, I, okay. I found. Just to show you a little bit of that. At last, one motion picture dares to ask the most important question. Of our time. Can a band of lovable misfits save their beloved Possum Lodge from the clutches of an evil land baron? Guilty of all charges, damages totaling ten thousand dollars. <laughs> Probably not. Yes, I have an idea. When I get my hands on Possum Lodge, I have an idea. It'll be a different story. Zoo, I got an idea. Here it is. Unless they find themselves a pair of heroes. What is it that we do that's, you know, excellent? We work with duct tape. Meet Red. It's a duct tape contest in three days, and I plan to be there. And Harold. <laughs> Third prize, ten thousand dollars. You're going to make sure they never get there. Have you seen a van go by towing a giant duct tape goose? <laughs> that was so cool! <laughs> you saw it too. Now the highway's getting crowded. I knew it was you, I knew it! <laughs> you know what's really cool? You know what's really cool? You know what's really cool? Don't make me kill you, Harold. Okay. The competition's getting fierce. <laughs> We're gonna die! <laughs> Red and Harold. Can you make it stop? <laughs> are going under the radar. After them! And way over their heads. Uncle Red, I'll give you back your nephew. And you give me that silver goose of yours. Hey, think about it. Okay. Steve Smith. What's your citizenship? Canadian. Pretty obvious. And Patrick McKenna. <laughs> was a drink, drink. Red Greens. Duct tape forever. With a title like that, it's got to be funny. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, oh, man. Eh? There's a scene in that movie where uh, <laughs> the, sh the sheriffs were operating a, a huge backhoe, and he picks up the, the sheriff's cop car, and he's supposed to lift it across a big cavern. Well, not a cavern, but like a, a ditch. tunnel ditch in the road, right? There was, because he can't get by. And the, 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 the trick is the guy, he loses control of it and it lands upside down in the, and fills the trench and then I drive Not over anymore. it in the possum van, right? 
So we could, we shot that up at uh, Camp Brabuff. You know where that is up in Burlington? Okay, doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we go for the shoot that day, and we're driving in, and there's like, there's a car upside down here, there's a car upside down, there's upside down. What the heck's going on? We go the the uh, the backhoe's operator's name was Jeff. I knew him. I said, Jeff, what's all that? He says, oh, I was practicing, oh. <laughs> <laughs> practicing flipping and got, cars. Yeah, and he got it in one take. Shoot, yeah. boom, and the car went right in there. So. Nice. And then I know you also had an accident, didn't you, on this show? I did. I that that goose. There's a there's a, a shot where I I cut the goose open and I I throw a, a, I take a hockey stick out of it and throw it away. And there's a cameraman. It was a moving shot, and the camera was right here. And he says, "Whatever you do, don't hit the camera with that's a hundred fifty thousand dollar camera. Don't hit the camera with the hockey stick." So the the, the props guy was let me say, "I got two knives. I got a sharp one and a blunt one. What do you want?" I said, "Give me the sharp one." You know. So I cut the thing, and I had the knife in this hand. No, I had the knife in this hand, and I threw the hockey stick way up over the camera, and my hand came down, and that went, and the knife went right through my hand. So Ugh. that was a, I think it was the first day of shooting, and uh, I wanted to drive myself to the hospital. I didn't want the I didn't want to lose the shoot day, and so somebody took me, and uh, it, I just it was just nerve damage. I, I was really lucky. Yeah. I, my, my fingers still kind of work, but I, yeah. I can't feel anything. So I, that's why I don't play the guitar anymore or anything. But yeah, because I had asked Steve to play guitar for yeah. you folks here tonight, but. You know, he stabbed himself. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they said it might come back, but that was 2001. I've almost yeah. given up hope. Yeah, I'd give up at this point. <laughs> so what about the future now, Steve? Um, you know, you're kind of retired, right? Or wouldn't you say No, that? I can't retire. I okay. tried retiring. When I stopped doing the show in 2005, that winter I played 162 rounds of golf in 180 days. That's not, that's not okay. <laughs> and I didn't get better. And then I was, my creative <laughs> energies, were, I was just saying things to my friends and they were starting to get annoyed. So I thought, I need to share my talent with a bigger audience. So out of that, I wrote a couple of books and I started touring. I did four tours, the US and Canada. And I did my last tour last year. And, uh, and now I'm doing a, a podcast with my son, hosting with my son. And we have, we created, but it's, it's, it's not really like a podcast. Podcast, you just talk till you think of something. <laughs> ours is <laughs> ours is totally 100% scripted. We created oh. 19 characters and they come in and do little you know the uh, interviews or we go out and a lot some was out in the field. I even do handyman handyman stuff and it's all it's like old style radio. It's all theater of the mind. You hear oh, yeah. the sound and you can you can picture what I'm doing. So Wow. Yeah, it's, I got to check that out. I I'm not much of a podcast guy yet. Oh, you got to check it out. It. I mean there was one where I um, I made a hot tub and I I ran it through a K car engine and the, so that's what heats it you know uh, the, the uh, yeah, yeah and, the, and then with a remote start because a, a car runs at 150 degrees that's a little hot for a hot tub so when you get to like 110 you just Turn shut it, it down <laughs> hey i'm telling you he's yeah, a I genius <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah for sure uh, well that's the future then more of that i guess hey uh, you're yeah. not gonna quit you're just gonna keep writing and I, thinking I would, stuff. if the podcast keeps going i would i'm really enjoying it because of the the, the creative demand i can do it in my house and we're not we we don't have any sponsors we don't have any commercials it's completely um, uh, patron supported you know uh, subscribers and 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 th you can get in for a dollar a month right and I'm thinking like if you don't have a dollar you know I'm not I'm not going to bother you and if what we're doing isn't worth a dollar we probably shouldn't be doing <laughs> yeah. it so I'm just going to let it we're doing twelve we've we've uh, third one uh, went on yesterday. And we're going to do 12 for sure and see where we're at. But I'm hoping it, it runs for a while. And how often are there? It's, when it's the last Sunday of every month. The last Sunday of every month. And it's and about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, something like that. And how do people find it? Uh, go to redgreen.com and the link is right there. Right. That's where I, I think I saw it there. Redgreen.com. Yeah, we've had really great response. I, I think it's, well, we're having fun, so who cares? Yeah, that's <laughs> right, eh? <laughs> Well, geez, I wish we could finish off with a song. We're getting close to the end, end here, but... Uh, you could hum something, I could dance. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, let's not do that. All right. uh, I'm just going to say thank you so much for hey, being on pleasure. our show. It flew by, my friend. Hey, flew by. Hey, look, we got applause wow. on this yeah, one. Yeah, we got hey, a sitting that's, ovation. That's great. And before we go, I, I have a few other people I'd like to thank. Marie Phillips, who's been our sponsor, a great sponsor for a, a while with her company, uh, Next Steps Planning and IPC Securities. Also want to thank Nathan Fleet, our main camera guy here. Uh, I think you can see his stuff on NathanFleet.com. 
Uh, we got Dave Plant on sound. Mark Scola is the guy that does all the technical stuff to get it out to you folks on YouTube. And um, we got Patrick Maye from Clear Cable, who's also working, uh, getting it online. And our theater staff here, Dan Fournier and Neil Miller. So I also want to announce that next week we're dark. The theater is dark because it's uh, Labor Day, right, on next yeah, Monday. It is, yeah. So we're not going Can't to work be on here. Labor Day. That's oh, a rule. Hey. Don't understand that, I don't think. I'd be against the law. <laughs> but the following week after that, we've got uh, Boris Brat. Wow, nice. That's going from one extreme to the other, yeah, I, think, I think. it is. You know, musically or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet he doesn't know any Steve Smith songs. <laughs> <laughs> but and then again, we don't know how to play symphony, so. No. Uh, there's Boris Brat. The week after that is Ian Thomas, as nice. I mentioned, September 21st. And the 28th, it's Rick Emmett of um, oh, nice. Triumph, yeah. you know, the big band. But that was long ago. We're going to find out what Rick's been doing since the 80s. So that should be good. So that's in two weeks. Um, so I hope to see you then. You can take next week off and do whatever. Uh, I think, though, it would be only fitting, Steve, if we uh, finished with the man's prayer or something oh, like absolutely. that. Oh, absolutely. All right. Okay. Bow your heads. You ready? Bow, bow your head. I'm a man, man but I can, I can change, change if I, I have, have to, to, I guess. Yes. <laughs> the man's prayer. All right, thanks for joining us, folks, tonight on Hamilton Originals with Steve Smith. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks a lot. credits roll. Thank you.